Great. Well, good evening, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us um, tonight. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to Bristow's. Uh, my name is Marek Patetsky. I'm a partner in the corporate group here. Um, and now, as advertised, we're going to be talking to you this evening about um, IP and real estate issues, um, particularly as they affect transactions in the tech sector. As you all know, um, uh, transactional activity in the tech sector is booming at the moment, so we hope the talk's timely and interesting. Um, just looking at the agenda for for the evening. Um, in a short moment, my partner Toby Crick is going to give us a, uh, a quick overview um, of, uh, of the key IP rights, maybe a bit of a, a refresher for those of us who aren't uh, IP lawyers. Um, and then he'll be looking at some of the, the, the key issues around um, protection and ownership of IP, which come up so often on, uh, on tech deals. Um, I will then look at um, IP due diligence, and with a particular focus on how to make that due diligence process as productive as possible uh, with the resources available. Um, Toby and I are then going to uh, look at a few case studies, um, looking at some of the issues in a real life context um, and uh, sharing some war stories perhaps. Um, we'll then pass on to uh, our colleague Tim Allen, who is going to uh, look at uh, the, uh, the current market, um, the current real estate market for, for tech businesses um, and talk us through some of the issues to think about um, in connection with corporate transactions on the real estate side. So, um, with that, I'll uh, hand over to Toby. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for coming along. Um, as Marek said, this audience is almost entirely lawyers. So, for those of you who are IP lawyers in particular, some of this will be quite basic. Nothing more so than this picture of what an IP right is. And, and I think we decided to start right at the beginning because, first of all, we didn't know who was going to come, and second of all, all of us as lawyers find ourselves having to explain IP basics to our business clients and particularly on tech deals where you're either acting for a small um, developer of technology or as is more likely the case with most of this audience you're buying off someone like that you sometimes need to just really spell out to the clever person or the team of entrepreneurs you know, this is what you have to think about and explain to us so we can put a valuation on what we're buying so you know we always sometimes find ourselves starting right back to basics, what is IP? Typically, of course, in software-based businesses, as so many other tech city type businesses are, we're talking copyright, because that's the primary right that arises in software. But also, most of these businesses have trademarks, whether registered or not. Some of them will have database rights, some of them may use or come across other things like performance rights. Have to say, plant variety rights, less common in tech city, but life science side of our practice obviously is always coming up against that. And then, of course, there is confidential information. One of the great things we have to get to the bottom of when we're doing diligence with clients is, is what you say is intellectual property actually intellectual property, or is it just some really good ideas that you've packaged up and ascribed a value to? So, as I think all of us know, there is no intellectual property in an idea, but one of the things we always counsel our clients on and one of the things we always look when we're buying a small ad tech or fintech business is have they protected their ideas? You know, a duty of confidence is all very well, but really you want more than that. You want NDAs, you want non-compete clauses, you want, and, and one of the things we look at, one of the things we advise people even before they start paying us, small startup businesses, is just cover this stuff off. It's not particularly hard to cover off, it's not unexpected to cover it off. But if a business hasn't covered it off, Marek will explore ways of, sort of reverse engineering the, um, the, the, the way the business is run to ensure that by the time investment money comes in or by the time a, a formal acquisition takes place, they are covered. Um, so again, if it is IP, who owns it? Um, fundamentally, it depends how it was created. As most people here again will know, but, but many, most every client you talk to doesn't know. If it's created by an employee, their employer owns it. But if it's out of hours, it's arguable. And if it's a freelancer, and remember, the tech businesses in London are almost entirely run by freelancers because nobody wants to take on that many full-time employees, then it really does depend on the contract. And the case I love being the age I am and thus the Star Wars geek is the Lucas and Ainsworth case where the guy who came up with the Stormtrooper mask did it as a freelance contractor and thus owns the Stormtrooper mask, much to um, the Lucasfilm's absolute shock and horror. Um, when you're dealing with the geeks who set up 
fintech and ad tech businesses, they really understand that one because it's quite a life thing that they grew up with too, so they can get their head around that. Um, so basically, make sure the contract covers you. Uh, so then, there you are. You're looking at the client, the, the, the potential acquisition target, or you're advising your client. They do own their IP. They've got it on proper terms. How are they going to exploit it, or how have they been exploiting it? The question is, have they been exploiting it in a way that protects them and their rights in it, or have they accidentally been giving it away? Um, again, typically in an IP license, you have background IPR, stuff that existed beforehand, and foreground IPR, the stuff that's generated during the project. It is owned by the terms of the contract or contribution and ownership rules if the contract is silent. Often these things are silent, but it is very easy to say we own it all if you're developing something. It's very easy to sign a contract that says your customer owns it all if you're not careful. And there are lots of ways that you can fall into traps when you're doing this. And one of our case studies looks at that. And some of it, you know, you need to be a really clever lawyer to spot that there's a trap there. But often, often our clients sign up to things without having read them and find themselves in trouble when it comes to the investor round. That actually maybe they've, they've lost the IP in their products. Um, so... These are the, the, the classic checklists we look at when we're looking at co key contracts of investment targets, ad tech and fintech businesses. What's already existing? What's the scope of use of any license that have been granted? What's being created? Who owns it? How long do the rights and the rights to use those rights subsist? And what, how, how can you get out of it? What happens if the project goes wrong? And that was a whistle-stop tour because... I've seen where you all come from, but if anyone has any questions based on that whistle top store, like me to dig into anything in more detail, please do say. But otherwise, Marek will move into the more the corporate due diligence side of the IP transaction stuff. Thanks, Harry. Great. So, um, IP due diligence. Nobody likes due diligence. It's it's not the most interesting uh, part of any transaction. Uh, but it is a necessary evil. Um, so I'm going to look at um, the sort of different approaches you can take to the process, and hopefully um, we, can, we can look at some, some tips for, for getting the most out of it. Um, why do it? Well, I've, I've just stuck up on a slide here um, the sort of main categories of, of people who might be looking to do um, due diligence, and um, I've sort of put them on a bit of a scale as to the intensity or the quantity of diligence they might do. At, at one extreme here, um, at the bottom and probably close to the heart of our friends from Royal Mail who are in the room is uh, a company preparing for IPO uh, where you'd expect an incredibly intense and intrusive level of, of diligence, um, lawyers all over the IP assets. Um, perhaps at the other end of the spectrum you've got um, a business looking to take a, a, a license of a bit of IP and, and there we find actually quite a low uh, level of diligence typically done on the, on the underlying assets. Um, a lot of people prepared to take things at face value and then with you know, angel or venture capital or corporate investors, it's, it's usually somewhere in the middle in terms of how much diligence is, is done. But I think what I'd like to um, maybe get to by the end of this talk is, 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 um, is an appreciation that it's not necessarily the qu quantity of diligence that you're doing that's important, but the quality of it and the focus of it. Um, so, you know, when, when to kick off a diligence process, obviously as, as lawyers we would invite you to, uh, to get the process underway as early as possible in the deal process. Um, but there are really sound reasons for doing that, particularly if you're looking at a tech business uh, where um, a huge amount of the value um, uh, an opportunity can, can be in the, in the intellectual property. Um, if you look at it early enough, you can, you can factor it into discussions around valuation or even the strategic viability of the transaction, um, and you can, you can drive uh, appropriate deal terms. Um, I think generally people who are buying or licensing IP get that. Um, what we find is that IP owners, uh, so sellers or licensors, um, tend to undervalue the benefits of, of actually... Uh, performing a bit of due diligence on themselves, a bit of preemptive or self-diligence ahead of a deal. Um, and, and as a result, they often end up on the back foot in negotiations so that, you know, that, that, they, that the investor or the acquirer is, is sifting through stuff saying, well, what about this? What about that? 
um, and they find themselves, A, losing credibility, B, um, on, on the wrong end of negotiations around value. Um, a, a question that does often come up is, um, well, look, you know, why are we spending all of this money, time, effort on, on diligence? Can't we just rely on a package of really good warranties? Um, you know, why won't the investor, let's say, rely on these, these extensive warranties we're giving? Um, and I think the important thing to realize is that, um, you know, no matter how good your lawyers, you're really unlikely to be able to recover in litigation uh, the full amount of the loss or damage that you've suffered if the IP portfolio you think you're buying turns out to be, to be quite different and, and of a different quality or scope or extent. Um, you've also got a load of risks in there, including, you know, is, is the person who gave you the warranty still worth, worth um, suing? Um, you know, warranties by their nature as well are, are likely to be much narrower than a due diligence process. Um, the whole process of negotiating warranties is about uh, the, the seller or, or the license or, you know, b building up barriers to a claim uh, and, and qualifying things by reference to their own awareness. Um, by contrast, due diligence is all about, you know, uncovering things, um, uh, drilling down to the unknowns uh, and maybe finding out things that the company itself didn't appreciate. So I would say, you know, look at warranties and due diligence as quite separate things. They're complementary. Um, and, and, you know, if you get your diligence right, it'll help you get good warranties um, and, and drive better deal terms. Um, so looking then at some approaches to due diligence, um, I've stuck up on a slide here a, a fairly outdated but not, unfortunately, extinct way of doing um, diligence on IP rights. And, and as you can see, it's a, a real focus on, on registrations and on that really, you know, robust package of warranties. Um, but, but what it doesn't do is, is step back and look at the business and, and, and say, well, look, where is the real value here and which rights should we be focusing on? So I would suggest that a, a much better way to do it is to, is to actually start not with the IP, but with the business itself. Understand what, what are the business's key products, what are the key markets it operates in, what are its plans uh, 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 under, underpinning its projections and, and crucially, you know, where is it getting the bulk of its revenue and profits from? Um, and once you've done that, you can then work out which IP assets underpin the majority of that business's value um, and you can produce a fairly focused um, uh, due diligence plan. So for example, if 90% of the profits of your, uh, of your tech company uh, derive from a single product in two or three markets, um, that is where you are going to channel your efforts and arguably everything else is, is, is going to be subject to a much higher level of materiality before you bother <coughs> bringing it into the scope uh, of your exercise. You're just looking for showstopper issues outside that core area of focus. And I think if you can maintain that focus throughout your DD exercise, it, 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 it means A, you're maximizing your resources uh, and, and getting value for money, but also it gives you time and space to identify and then grapple with any gaps or weaknesses or threats that you identify and you can actually you know, maybe have a bit of time and a, and a fighting chance of putting them right without the distraction of all of that, that background noise. Um, so once you've, uh, you've, you've, discussed, you've defined your scope, you've got your materiality uh, levels right, you've, you've got your focus really, really tight, um, what are the issues to cover? Well, I think you know, Toby sort of touched on them really. Um, I mean, when you're looking at the rights, it's not just about unraveling the, the different rights that can underlie an asset, um, but, but also about assessing the quality of them. So, you know, just, just because uh, somebody has a right doesn't necessarily mean it gives the protection that you would expect or want. Um, so, you know, you have to consider, um, is it going to be the barrier to competition that I'm, I'm hoping it will be? Is this, is this IP right going to keep competitors out of my space? Um, you know, has, has the company already given away significant rights uh, to third parties? For example, uh, you know, a startup tech business might think, well, do you know what, we're, we're just not going to do something in China or India uh, in, in, in the future. That's just not our focus. So an exclusive license of, that, of, of, of our IP in that territory is no big deal. But that could be of, of real strategic importance to a corporate investor um, or, or even a, a you know, private equity investor who's looking <laughs> to those territories to, to drive growth. Um, and then obviously, you know, uh, the next part is, um, is establishing um, ownership and then crucially um, 
uh, the, the chain of title. Uh, and that effectively is a, an exercise in joining the dots from the company whom you, you hope and you, you verified owns the IP all the way back to the original creator of the IP right and making sure that you've got you know, um, legal binding uh, documentation in place um, uh, uh, for every link in that chain and title. Um, and that's, I mean, again, often underestimated as a, as a, as a tool by, um, by, by growing companies um, uh, who really do benefit from getting that, that, that all in place before they go anywhere near an investor or, a, or, or an acquirer. Um, because the first thing people are going to say is, show me the chain of title, prove to me that you own this and that there's an unbroken, uh, unbroken history in the IP. Um, so just a few problem areas then which are quite commonly... Uh, arise on, on due diligence exercises. Um, universities, they're wonderful, fantastic sources of tech, very rich, um, and there's a lot of great stuff coming out of them, but I suppose just maybe two or three things to, to bear in mind. Um, they're funded from a variety of sources, uh, including uh, charities, foundations, and, and other commercial organizations, and that funding will often come with <coughs> with significant strings attached. Um, and those strings may, may also um, apply to the IP that's generated. So just be careful to make sure you've understood, um, I think, the, 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 the source of funds for the, for the research um, that, that's gone in, that's given rise to the, to the technology in question, and any implications it might have. Likewise, universities are a pretty open place. They, um, engage and employ uh, and use people from a, a variety of areas and so it may not be the case that the people working on the technology in question were all um, either undergraduate students or employees of the university you could have you know visiting academics in there you could have postgrads whose whose status is not entirely clear um, <coughs> joint ownership um, something best to be avoided if possible this is where um, two people for example um, create a, an IP right in, 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 uh, jointly um, and have joint ownership of it. It's pretty messy and, and I would say if in the course of a, a DD exercise you identify that the, the business uh, that you're acquiring or the, or, or the, the IP that you're licensing is, is jointly owned, uh, you really want to see a, a very clear um, agreement in place uh, which clarifies exactly how that IP um, asset is going to be uh, protected and exploited. Uh, and, and crucially, what's going to happen where the joint owners can't agree um, on one of those elements or, or, or there's a deadlock. Um, improvements is an important area, but it's actually within one of the uh, case studies we're going to look at, so um, I'll part that for now. Um, products under development, uh, well, an obvious point really with tech businesses, you know, they're, they're moving very quickly, the technology's um, evolving uh, quickly. So, Focusing the, the, the diligence exercise solely on, on, on products in market can be a little bit narrow and you have to bear in mind that a, a lot of the, the value in the business may be within products under development and there it's really important to understand uh, what the business's strategy uh, for, um, for, for capturing and protecting intellectual property is uh, because it well, may well be that a lot of these rights are in the course of being developed. Um, uh, and, and, and it's just, just a question of, of ensuring that the company's got decent procedures in place to capture it all. Um, a sale of part of a business or a group or, or a subsidiary from out of a group can, can really throw up some interesting issues, particularly if, if the retained bit of the business and the, uh, the, the, the part being sold or the company being sold um, all make use of, of, of the same piece of IP. You need to separate that IP out, decide who's going to hold it, who's going to own it, and then what licenses uh, to and from those, the, the, those sides of the, uh, um, of the transaction might need to be granted. Again, if you're, if you're a seller um, and you're going into this, the process, it, it really does pay to have all of that figured out in advance and have a really strong proposition as to, as to, as to which side of the fence any particular piece of IP falls um, because it's, it's a real battleground. Um, and the last point, IP underlying critical licenses. I mean, it well may be that, um, that the, the, the target in question, say, doesn't actually own the IP, but just has a, a license, maybe an exclusive license of it. And there, um, really, it's a question not only of, of ensuring you're comfortable with the terms of the license and that those terms are robust, but also then going down to the next level and checking that you're also comfortable that the underlying IP 
is, um, is valuable uh, and, and it's been properly protected um, and, and gives you the, you know, the, the, the freedom to operate or the, um, or, or, or the protection that you're looking for. Um, so yeah, this, this is just a recap really of the, of the reasons to, 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 to produce a really focused plan um, uh, for, for DD, you know, really zone in on the areas that count um, and, that are, and that underpin the, the business that you're looking at. Um, I think from, you know, from a, a buyer's point of view, it, it makes sense. It, it saves costs. It, uh, it, it, it avoids disappointment. Um, and, uh, and from a seller's point of view, you know, it, it, uh, time and time again, I've seen that companies that prepare for a sale by doing a little bit of preparatory DD on themselves, um, they, they, they stay in a much stronger position through negotiations. They get their deals quicker on better terms. Um, and, and crucially, um, there's much less reliance placed on warranties, indemnities, <coughs> and, um, and, and hopefully any sort of claims or litigation um, are ultimately avoided. Um, so with that, I think we're now going to look at some case studies to put some flesh on the bone, unless anyone's got any questions they'd like to ask at this stage about IP due diligence. Right. In which case, Toby. Cool. Um, yeah. Thank you. I don't need that, actually. So this is an example based on a couple of real-life events that have happened to clients of ours. Um, in this example, the small company is developing and maintaining a solution for a big company. The um, small company develops the initial thing and signs up to the big company's standard paper without really concentrating on it. As I said, this happens. You, you need to make sales. Um, you know, classic background IP owned by the ad tech company. The enhancements are owned by the big brand. But the um, maintenance includes the provisions of new versions of the solution. So they're getting paid to upgrade and modify their solution. Meanwhile, they're getting more customers. So that solution that they originally sold to their first customer is being enhanced by them as part of maintenance. But in their contract with their first customer, it says any enhancement with a small e, not a deliverable that we agree in a statement of work, but any enhancement we deliver is owned by you, my customer. Sorry, are you talking about where the ad tech company is doing the work on its own platform, basically? It's enhancing its own platform. So initially it did some special enhancements for the big brand, and then it provides maintenance to the big brand. It thinks, standard sort of software world, <coughs> that the enhancements are part of its solution and the for, you know, any deliverables, formal deliverables are owned by the, the customer, fine. But because the drafting wasn't zeroed in on, it's just a small e enhancement. The, um, the ad tech company discovers to its horror when the due diligence exercise is undertaken that the person who's about to buy its business says, hold on a second, you own this code you created three years ago but every single enhancement you've delivered to all of your customers since is actually owned by your first customer. And all your other customers are using this license in breach of the rights that you granted to your first customer. And you are absolutely up the swanee. Now, it's a slightly extreme, but not a very extreme version of something that really did happen to a client of ours. And what do you do? And if anyone has any instant solutions, I'd be interested to hear them because then we could chat them around. But otherwise, I'll, I'll just keep going with some, some of the things we tried to solve this problem. As the big brand turns around and says, you know, so our contract's clear. Anything you provide as part of support is an enhancement and any enhancement is owned by us. And we're paying you good money for this and we're your keystone client and that was always our intention. But luckily, in this real life example, they didn't play too hardball because they could have started sending letters before actions to all our other customers. And, and a deal was done. But part of doing the deal was to really dig into the underlying contract and find enough arguments to throw saying, no, 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 enhancements with a small e only covers formal deliverables. New versions are different. Till the price became a reasonable price and the deal, and the deal was done. And that was the actual outcome there. But I think that's what you can do is you go along and you try and do a deal talking politely and nicely and hoping that they don't spot the opportunity and if they do spot the opportunity get aggressive quite early with the help of litigators letters but as Narek said that can be very expensive it's a it's a nasty place to be in and so again depends on your position 
But if you are a big brand, and you're looking at some small outfit, this is something to consider about whether and how much of their standard maintenance developments you want to own or not. And if you are a small startup company, keeps coming back to, or you're advising one, or you're thinking of setting one up, and your co-entrepreneurs are just techie, want to go all hell for leather. This is, this is a real life example of where just a tiny little difference between the word enhancement and a formal definition of deliverable end up cost, could have cost a company everything, its whole business. It didn't, but it could have made a material difference to it. And so this is a, a real life example of where you're sort of getting a bit geeky about a bit of drafting and a bit of understanding of what was created when can make a material difference to the success or failure of a business. Cool. Any questions on that one or thoughts? So number two, what is the IP value? So this is a, again based on a real life scenario. A um, couple of founders of a tech technology company pitched a uh, private equity house who was looking at acquiring the business and they um, you know, put a lot of emphasis on the company's solid patents and some clever software which they felt really kept out the competition. Um, big code, that should be PE house actually, sorry, in the third line. Um, so the, the private equity house took, undertook a, a pretty full and, uh, and, and costly legal due diligence exercise, but um, not necessarily focusing in on the IP perhaps as early as they should have done. And, and just before signing, one of their, their technical people had a look at one of the patents and, and said, well, you know, Houston, we, we have a problem um, because the, the key patent uh, didn't appear to cover off um, the, te the Techco's core product. It was just um, protecting some peripheral elements. And in fact, there was nothing sinister going on. It wasn't as though the founders had, uh, had set out to mislead them. Um, actually, they'd, they'd simply you know, got their patent agents to, to get, go out and get the best patent they could for their, for their solution, for their product. Um, and they tried, but um, in the end, um, they, they were only able to, to patent these peripheral aspects of it because they, the, the core solution in question uh, wasn't really inventive enough. Um, to, to sort of uh, make things worse when negotiating the, the warranties uh, and uh, when the company was, you know, carefully taken through all of the, uh, the detailed warranties, um, it, they, they ended up disclosing that a lot of the software was not that clever. Um, I mean, it was, it was great, but it was mostly off-the-shelf software with a bit of customization, not this wonderful bespoke package uh, that the PE house was expecting. So, you know, what, what happened next? Well, cue a fairly, uh, a, a fairly brutal uh, renegotiation of the terms, really. I mean, you know, the private equity house, um, as is typical, had, had built up a pretty um, extensive financial model of the business, which assumed um, that they would have IP which would keep compet competitors out for, for a reasonable period. Um, and they put quite a lot of store in that. So, so they kind of had to recut that model um, uh, and, and, and place a lot more emphasis on the brand of the business and the, um, the, the first mover advantage it had just by virtue of being out there in the market um, early. Um, and and not, with, not, not surprisingly, that spat out quite a different number um, in terms of the valuation they placed on the business. I mean, the, the good news is that in this case, uh, the deal was salvaged. It, it went ahead, but um, we saw a, a, a real sort of renegotiation of the terms. And it, it wasn't just value. And, and I, I guess these are some things to think about as well. If, you're, if, if, if the boot's on the other foot, if you're, if you're the buyer in this scenario. Um, but, but what ended up happening was a, a large element of the cash of the consideration that the, the founders were going to receive ended up being deferred. Um, and linked to the, the future performance of the business over the coming years um, so that that sort of threat um, uh, from competitors uh, would, would have an impact uh, on the actual payout that the founders would get to a much greater degree than, than was previously going to be the case. Um, so not fatal, but again, a classic example where had these guys done a little bit of, um, of a preparatory DD on themselves and maybe gone in with a more realistic and positive presentation of their IP portfolio, um, they could probably have come out in a, much, in a much better place because once you're in the jaws of a deal, um, it, it is very hard to recover from, from something like this. And if anyone's got any observations or, or thoughts on that, I'll pass you back to... This, one's, um, this one ends up 
kind of a similar ending, but it gets there in a very different way. Um, are people here have heard of open source software? <coughs> Maybe. So a lot, almost all software developed now is developed using open source components to a greater or lesser extent. But some people are still wary of open source software because open source by definition is open, so you can't control it, you don't have rights over it. There are broadly two types of open source software license. I'll come on to consider in a second. And, and often the crucial issue is which kind of open source license the code you developed was based on, permissive or restrictive. So are these businesses, they build their tech, a bunch of techies, download code off the web, stick it together in a clever way, and produce a product. That's how software is made. And everybody knows that's how software is made. But if you do that without any diligence, without thinking about the licenses that are signed up to, you could find yourself in trouble. And certainly when you get to the point where you're going to market, it probably makes sense to do the kind of audit of that software, which needn't be expensive and needn't even involve lawyers to discover which bits of open source <laughs> software code have been used in your product and what licenses apply to them. Because strictly speaking, if you sub-license open source software, you have to, for many of them, at least tell the people you're sub-licensing to that you are using open source code. <laughs> Often that's the only restriction, but if you've breached it, you're in breach of license and thus in trouble. So anyway, this, this fintech business, it was delivering a clever tool to the big banks in London, and it used open source code. It compiled it, which means turned it into object code that you can't read with your eyes. So the banks they were selling it to didn't know it was based on open source because it was compiled and you can't decompile it without, without going through lots of hoops that people wouldn't go through. So they presented it as if it was all their own code and they licensed it as if it was all their own code. So right away they were in breach of the open source license terms they'd used, which they would have got away with probably until it came to exit. And the first thing the big software house that was going to buy them did was send... I think it was Black Duck, which is one of these companies that specializes in crawling over code and identifying whether it's open source and if so, where it comes from. And they said, much to their horror, I can't imagine they didn't expect to find open source there, but tactically it was a great line in the negotiation on price. You, yeah, you've used open source and not declared it. What are we going to do about this? So is this, a reasonable, is this a reasonable tactic? Had they massively undervalued their company? Did they have true assets? How do you get around this? Now, in this case, there actually are technical solutions. Because having identified the open source code, you can then identify the licenses on which it's made. As I said earlier, there's two kinds of licenses, a restrictive one and a permissive one. A restrictive license is the classic open source license, or a copyleft license, which is the ones, the real sort of believers in open, the open movement go for, which says, if you license my code, if you use my code, anything you do to my code and add to my code is subject to the same terms as my code. So anything, I give it to you for free, you improve it, you must pass it on for free if you pass it on. If you just use it internally, fine. If you start selling it, you're in breach of license and we'll come after you. And that's, that's a restrictive open source license. But most open source software that is really used is on a permissive basis, which is, it's open, do with it what you will. My favourite open source licence really is called the what the F licence, and if you Google it, it says do what the F you like with it. But interestingly, it says don't use our name on it. So even the what the F licence has one restriction in it, which is don't tell anyone you got it from us. It's quite interesting, but most of them are a bit more sophisticated. The, the big ones are the ones by MIT and Stanford, uh, Apache is the really well known one. So those, if, if you use that kind of open source code, pretty much you're fine. You can carry on using it. Even if you've used the restrictive code, it depends how you've used it. There may be technical ways around it. But the point is, a decent developer will know this and should have kept a library. If they haven't, that would make you worry about the valuation. In this case, they had kept the libraries. It was all there. And we could go through it, identify what was on a permissive license basis, find the restrictive license basis, identify how it was used technically, and then when it was used technically and it really probably had infected the underlying product, that was cleaned up. 
they reverse engineered it. They took out the open source code that was infecting all their products and put in proprietary code or open source code that didn't infect all their products. They solved the problem. But it was only discovered during the bid process, so it did have an impact on their earn out. But fortunately, no claims arose for what they'd been selling beforehand. But that was the only bit that was left. But had they just had a bit more housekeeping and hygiene along the way, they would never have got into this. And this is something that doesn't just affect little companies. Most software is developed like this. Most big companies have an IT team that does a bit of software development themselves or gets contractors in to do it. And most of those people will use open source. Some companies are very bureaucratic about how you use open source. Some are not at all. But everyone should have a bit of cleanliness and housekeeping about it, whether you're going to sell your business or not, just to avoid running into these kind of problems. Um, so that's, that's the kind of thing. What was actually done with it and what records were there of it? You should keep it. Really, doing these audits is not that tricky and not that hard. And it, it does pay dividends. Has anyone got any questions on open source before I hand back to Marek? On that note, thank you. Oh, thanks, Toby. So, um, final case study then, looking at what happens when, uh, when founders of, um, of some of these uh, tech companies fall out, uh, which is not, not, not a totally uncommon occurrence. Um, in, in this case, it was an ad tech company. Um, founders, two of them fell out. One of them walked away. She went and joined a, a big um, ad agency. Um, the, uh, the remaining founder sort of uh, kept things ticking over and, um, uh, and then was looking to get some funds in from a corporate investor. And, and during the due diligence, obviously, the corporate investor unearthed this, uh, this skeleton in the closet, this, this rift uh, between the original founders, uh, and was particularly worried about it because it, it looked like she was instrumental in developing our tech's uh, core solution. So, you know, the investor, understandably, is, is saying, well, so, you know, w what is the deal here? Who owns the IP? Um, so the first place you look, of course, and, and, and which we looked, was, was the, con the contracts. Um, you know, firstly, was she an employee uh, of the ad tech company at, at the relevant time, going back to um, the, the, the rules that Toby um, set out earlier around ownership? That just wasn't clear, as, as is sometimes the case. I mean, both the founders were, uh, were, were doing a handful of other jobs at the time to try and bootstrap this, uh, this startup. They didn't draw a salary, um, and there was no contract of employment in place. So, so tricky to, to, to argue that. Um, proper contracts, no, there were none. Um, the shareholders' agreement was, was, was pretty silent on IP provisions and, and non-competes. Um, and, and, uh, and likewise, when she left, there were no special exit terms agreed. I mean, everyone expected that um, the, uh, the, the, the business was, was most likely to fail. Um, so I think no one felt it was necessary to go to the expense of, um, of setting out the terms uh, of the exit. And so we, 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 we sat down and said, well, what, what can we do? Um, there was no love lost between the founders. Um, uh, and, and in the end, we ended up... Um, running some pretty, uh, pretty, pretty technical arguments uh, centering around the fact that, um, uh, that, the, uh, that the departing founder had been a director during her time at, uh, at the ad tech company. And um, I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's often overlooked, but um, former directors of companies do still owe a duty uh, to, 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 to the company. Um, in relation to any information or opportunities um, or, uh, that they might have acquired um, while they were a director. They, they owe a duty to the company not to exploit that um, once they leave. Um, and we ran some arguments on that front. But, but unfortunately, um, that, that sort of track is, is limited in its use because you come up against a whole other body of law which quite justifiably says, well, look, you know, um, people are entitled when they're moving from one role to another to take with them the kind of uh, body of knowledge that they've developed and experienced in their own minds. You know, you can't expect people to erase their memories when they move from one job to another. They can take the sort of tools of the trade uh, with them. Uh, and so you end up with this really interesting sort of um, uh, clash between this concept of, well, look, you know, directors, they shouldn't, people shouldn't be exploiting information that, uh, or, or, or ideas or opportunities that they gained uh, by virtue of their role as a director, uh, but at the same time, you know, people have to be allowed to, uh, to get on and use the, the, the tools of the trade uh, and, and their experience in their next role. So 
that, that, that was all pretty tricky, and in the end of the day, um, as so often happens, it, it ended up in a bit of a negotiation, a bit of a, um, uh, a, bit of a horse trade. Um, and uh, fair to say, um, the, uh, the departing founder ended up uh, getting quite a windfall out of the arrangement. So the deal still happened, but again, you know, there's a significant loss of value, which probably didn't fairly reflect the relative contributions that both of the founders had made to the business. And, and, and for the, the investor involved, the whole thing was just a nightmare. I mean, the, the deal timetable went out the window. The costs were spiraling. You know, we, we spent ages um, trying, to, trying to get the deal done and, and looking at sort of all these exotic areas of the law to, to try and solve the issue, all of which was uh, a bit unnecessary and could have been avo avoided um, with a, a little bit of housekeeping at the time that the company was set up. And, you know, one of the first things we do um, when startups come to see us is just, it's just, you know, tell them to just get this basic stuff right, um, get, get, get your employment contracts in place, um, and, and get your IP uh, terms nice and clear. Um, so I think that's, that's the last of our case studies. So unless anyone wants to uh, ask a question or, or chip in at this point, um, I'll, I'll hand over to Tim, who's going to give us a an overview of the real estate market for tech companies. Thank you. Hello everyone. Uh, my name's Tim Allen. I'm an associate in the real estate team at Bristow's. And we're going to be talking about uh, real estate in the tech sector and some of the issues that we're seeing affecting our clients at the moment. So we're going to focus on uh, the corporate occupier market and particularly the changes we've seen in the last five years. Uh, the role that real estate has as, uh, in growth of tech businesses, the challenges and opportunities in the current markets, and uh, just to tie in with uh, what Marek was saying, when real estate should be an area of focus in a corporate transaction. Uh, so the corporate occupier markets, um, it's a unique market at the moment. Um, demand is extremely high. Uh, 2014 saw 15.9 million square foot of space transacted in central London. Uh, to put that in context, back in 2009, we were talking about 5 million square foot. Uh, what is interesting is last year, a million square foot was attributable to serviced office and business space providers. Now, a lot of uh, very early stage tech businesses like those uh, providers, so it's possible that the tech industry is responsible for that growth. Uh, the mid-market made up most of the transactions, so anything between 20 and 50,000 square foot. And we saw 29% of the total, uh, the total take up attributable to the TNT sector. Um, so if we look back to 2009, that was under 10%. And I think it's that change uh, which has attracted so many landlords and investors to tech sectors, um, uh, occupiers, because the increase has happened against the background of the financial crisis at a time when demand from the traditional uh, consumers of office space, so banks, uh, professional services firms like lawyers, was static or falling. Uh, in terms of rewards for investors, they've been pretty significant. If you were lucky enough to be in the Northern City Fringe, just last year you'd have seen 16% rental growth. Um, that is due partly because of this increase in demand, which is great, uh, but also because uh, there has been negative supply. Negative supply in a property context is buildings being taken out of commercial use. And one of the things that they're seeing even in Shoreditch and the Old Street Roundabout is buildings that have been translated back into residential because there's still a premium for that space. Uh, so supply in general, uh, the vacancy rate is 5.6 below. Uh, putting that in context, it's 40% the 2009 level. Uh, there's 3.8 million square foot of new space that's going to reach PC uh, in the coming year, but 50% of that is already pre-let. Um, the bottom line of which is, if you are looking for space in this market, what you're probably looking at is second-hand or refurbished space. So overall, we are looking at very high demand, very limited supply. Um, supply is expected to fall. Um, uh, Fairbrother, who are one of the main agents in Midtown, think that vacancy rate could get down to 2.5% next year. Um, but on the positive side for tech industry, uh, there are lots of landlords and lots of investors who have suddenly noticed the opportunities that the tech sector presents and they're interested in getting involved. 
So just thinking about the role of real estate in growth of tech businesses, uh, the most obvious way that it plays a role is it's a liability. Um, so the key issues for an occupier is how much are they going to pay, how long are they going to be committed. Um, price, that's entirely in the control of the purchaser, so they can choose the type of stock that they wish to take up. Uh, capital requirement, they can decide how much they want to fit out. Um, it's often said that tech uh, businesses are very cheap to fit out because all they really do is strip everything back to bare brick. So you can see the air conditioning and that's it done. Um, security, uh, that's really how much money they're prepared or able to set aside by way of rent deposits uh, if the landlord requires it. Uh, one of the areas that's very relevant, particularly if it's early or mid-stage business, is cost variation. There's two main ways that tech business can take space. It can be a license or they could take a, a full lease. Licenses, similar to the sort of thing you'd expect to take if you're going to a serviced office provider, tend to be fixed cost. If you go for a lease, it's ordinarily the case that there'll be a service charge, there'll be rent, uh, repair obligations. They will be accruing liabilities through the term. They're very hard to cope with if you are an early stage business with um, very narrow margins financially. For how long? Well, um, again, going back to contractual arrangements and licenses, uh, you would expect those to be very flexible. They typically contain a rolling break provision that would allow termination on something like six or 12 months. Uh, now, that sort of flexibility is fantastic when you're an early stage business and your success is very dependent on funding rounds or pitches and you have no real idea what your business will look like in a couple of years. But as you develop, business interruption becomes more of a risk. That encourages lots of occupiers to look towards full leases. Full leases have more of the advantages of outright ownership, but uh, they come with a trade-off. You have to commit for a minimum term. In the market at the moment, the minimum term tends to be five years. So just thinking about something which is slightly less obvious, or at least less obvious from a balance sheet assessment of tech businesses, and that's how they use real estate as a resource. Um, there's two areas I was going to talk about. That's knowledge workers and clustering. Um, knowledge workers are, um, well, they're, they're definitely spoken about a great deal in the property press as being one of the key assets of tech businesses um, alongside their IP rights. As a demographic, they're said to be relatively young. Um, from an employment perspective, uh, they are um, mercenaries and missionaries, is what the recruitment consultants call them, um, which boils down to they don't tend to stay in role for a very long time. Um, their preferences, uh, at the moment if you talk to tech businesses that are doing property selection, it's all about uh, the proximity to uh, public transport, vibrant city culture, and uh, access to relatively affordable accommodation. So those are the factors that tend to drive uh, the location of buildings that tech businesses acquire. And because they are in a competitive market, real estate is being used as a means to build on competitive advantage by um, improving talent retention and recruitment. Because uh, tech industry businesses are interested in the preferences of knowledge workers, so are landlords, so are investors. And that is driving lots of the specialist investors that are coming into the um, tech world. And they are also pushing up prices in places like the Northern City Fringe, so Old Street Roundabout, for instance. Uh, clustering. Well, clustering is a, a new word for a very old concept. It's just a, a businesses in the same industry grouping together to share ideas, share opportunities. The advantages in the tech field, which is all about innovation, are fairly obvious. Uh, we also see with young tech businesses a great deal of informal collaboration between businesses and that's made possible by sh um, close physical proximity. I think to some extent um, clustering may just be the result of shared uh, property selection requirements. So if uh, we look back to 2007 to 2009, the cheapest place in London to take commercial real estate was the Old Street Roundabout and that area. So the uh, specialist investors who either through being canny or lucky uh, took space in that area have had a remarkable windfall. There are exclusions. FinTech we've been speaking about this afternoon. Uh, we've seen lots of FinTech businesses locating away from the traditional tech areas over towards their customer base. So you're seeing lots of um, uh, those businesses arriving in Canary Wharf. Canary Wharf loves that because it's creating diversity in their tenant base. 
uh, late stage tech businesses, so the real industry leaders, Google, Twitter, um, Total Jobs, Spotify, the size of the requirement that they have is so high that you um, just don't see the availability in the traditional tech areas. And so they're coming back into central uh, business districts. Uh, interestingly, they're acting a little bit like an anchor tenant. So they're bringing other smaller businesses back into the central business district as well. Um, so this is the digital halo. Um, I've heard it called the tech pandemic. Uh, the, uh, the map is the tech city map. So it's showing all of the businesses that consider themselves to be part of tech city. Um, ground zero in the middle of that is the old street roundabout. Uh, we are seeing lots of growth uh, northwards uh, into the, uh, the north part of the city area and also east and south. So uh, the South Bank, uh, the area at Canary Wharf and also uh, here east which is located in um, the Olympic Park. Uh, I'm, I'm very proud to be responsible for, for that, that blue dot. <laughs> Um, the, uh, the number at the top gives an indication, it says that it's 1,472 uh, companies that are inside the Tech City Group today. If we'd looked at that back in 2009, they thought there was 150. Tremendous growth. Um, so what are the challenges that face these tech businesses? Well, um, the most often quoted are scalability in the covenants test. Uh, scalability is just the ability to adapt uh, quickly to changing needs in real estate. So how quickly can you increase or offload space. Uh, if we were looking at a lease and somebody asked me to identify the scalability provisions, I'd be looking for security of tenure, so the statutory right of the tenant to remain in occupation at the end of the lease term, um, break rights for the tenant and the shorter the notice period for the tenant the better, and flexible provisions for assignment and underletting. To deal with increases in requirement, you would hope to see preemption rights and options but to be honest, none of those provisions are very common to see in a landlord standard draft. They will oppose grants of all of those provisions. And it's interesting to think why. Um, if we approach it from the bank's perspective, banks are obviously hugely important to the uh, real estate market in the centre of London. Um, debt finance is what has fuelled uh, investment in property for some time. They are uh, mostly concerned with the preservation of capital values. Uh, both because they have security over it and because of regulatory restraints now. And because they're concerned with capital values, their funding requirements uh, impose minimum lease terms. They'll also seek to ensure that the borrowers that are taken on by, uh, sorry, the occupiers that their borrowers grant leases to are strong financial covenants. And it's obvious why they do that. They're looking to make sure that their borrower is in the best possible place to meet their repayment obligations. Landlords as well, well, a landlord's valuation of his building will be affected by the quality of the covenants um, that are in occupation and also by the length of term that they're there, even if there's no default. So if they take on a questionable covenant for a short term, they give them too much flexibility, the value of their building has just reduced. Um, they are also keen to pre preserve an unfettered, uh, unfettered ability to deal with their asset. Uh, so there's been a very uh, fast change in the market now. Landlords looking forward have no idea how the, the market is going to continue to develop. So they're reluctant to build in, sca build in scalability options. Uh, the covenants test, well the covenants test is, is usually the net profits test. Um, that hasn't really changed since I started practice and was probably in place a long time before that. Uh, what you ask is can the, the occupier deliver audited accounts for three years showing net profits that are greater than three times the annual rent. If you pass that then chances are your covenant's acceptable. If you fail that, then either you're going to be declined as an occupier or if um, alternatively you'll be asked for additional security in the form of a rent deposit or a parent company guarantee. Um, that is all about the preservation of value for landlords. But the problem is it works incredibly poorly for tech businesses. <coughs> tech businesses do not have that financial history um, and one of the opportunities that we're starting to see in the market is because there's this rush of traditional landlords eager to get involved in the sector, they are starting to move into a slightly more detailed business analysis. So they're looking at um, you know, client lists, the IP that a business holds, and starting to look slightly beyond just the net profits test. 
there's lots of landlords and investors that are trying to break new districts for tech um, buildings and that goes beyond just painting the walls of the reception black. Um, they're actually trying to deliver usable space that reflects how um, the different types of investors and the different types of occupiers are using these buildings and trying to push out that use for 5, 10, 15 years time rather than just the next couple of years. Uh, for landlords and lenders, uh, we're seeing some increase in flexibility. It's limited, but there's a premium for it. So, you know, you're going to have to pay for those scalability options if you really want them. Uh, the reason that the risk is being accepted by landlords and lenders, I think it's really because it's just being seen as the price of participation in the sector. But it's always possible there'll be a change in the market. Um, we're in an election year. Uh, tech businesses are going to be very easily affected by changes in policy on tax, employment, and importantly, immigration. So, uh, corporate transactions. Um, this very much echoes what Marek was saying about um, due diligence being about quality and knowing when to focus on different aspects. Um, real estate is not going to be an area of focus on all transactions. Um, it would be fair to say that on, on almost all transactions, the key liabilities associated with real estate will be identified. Someone will tell the investor, the purchaser, what the rent is, when the rent reviews take place, if there's a break clause. What is harder to see is how real estate is being used as a resource. And so the purpose of asking these questions, and they should be asked at an early stage, is to try and identify how the business is making use of its occupation. So asking if relocation took place today, what would the commercial impact be? How easy would it be to, to secure alternative premises? Uh, that is an answer, uh, that's a question rather that will be best answered by a property agent. And property agents love to give you that sort of uh, free opinion because hopefully you'll then come back and use them to search for premises at a later point. Uh, what would the impact be on uh, key staff recruitment and retention? So going back to uh, the importance of knowledge workers. If the corporate transaction or the medium term business plan suggests that there's going to be a sudden increase or decrease in real estate or an intergroup assignment, obviously that needs to feature in your due, due diligence review. But finally, um, the, the real clinches are if there's going to be a change in tenant identity or there's an existing parent company guarantee um, to tenant covenants, you need to start looking at that at a very early stage. And I think the, the reason for that is um, because of the time scale that property transactions move at, um, not because of lack of enthusiasm on my part, um, but assignments, lease variations, different transactions in the property sector can move slower than the corporate deals to which they relate. Um, back in the uh, tenant market, there's lots of available space. Uh, there are a number of investors, a number of purchasers who took the view that, well, let's say there's a technical terms of the, uh, a breach of the terms of the lease. How likely is it really that that's going to be enforced provided that the rent still gets paid? A landlord's not going to want to take back void premises. That logic doesn't really apply in today's market. Um, there are lots and lots of landlords that are looking at deals they did back in 2009 and thinking that they're terribly <coughs> underrented and they're missing an opportunity. Similarly, um, there are lots that are looking for development opportunities. So just as a word of warning to finish on, um, be very wary of leaving property formalities to follow on if you feel that real estate's a key asset of the tech business. So with that doom-laden thoughts, uh, thank you very much for your attention. I'm going to hand back to Marek for questions.